So I'm watching UConn beat Purdue last night in the NCAA championship game, the end of the college basketball season. And yes, I'm weird and I watch sports a lot differently than most people. Uh, but the thought that kept running through my mind as I watched UConn and Purdue compete was, man, you can see the destruction of the black nuclear family on this basketball court. I'm watching the biggest game in men's college basketball, and it is being dominated by white guys. Both teams had predominantly white starting lineups. And I started thinking about why. Why is that? What happened? Basketball used to be dominated by black men. It's no longer the case, and you can see it everywhere. You can see it in the NBA. You can see it in men's college basketball. You can see it in women's college basketball. We're going to discuss all of that today. Welcome to Fearless with Jason Whitlock. I'm Jason Whitlock, your host. Happy Tuesday. Thanks for joining me. Awesome show plan for you today. TJ Moe and Steve Kim are going to join me later in the show, but this first part of the show will just be me and you as I unpack my thoughts about uh, college basketball and basketball as a whole. Uh, first thing you guys can do is go to blazetv.com slash fearless. Use the promo code fearless, and you can save $20 on your yearly subscription after you do that, and that is the most important thing, so take care of that. After you do that, if you're listening over Apple, hit the uh, five-star rating, help us fight the algorithm there. And then if you're watching over YouTube, hit the subscribes, hit the likes, hit the comments, the notifications, get in the chat, participate in the show. I'll be there in the live chat as I am most days looking for your comments. Uh, <clears throat> today's episode is brought to you by our good friends at Good Ranchers. Good Ranchers is locking in your price until 2026 when you subscribe to any of their boxes of 100% American meat and seafood. Use my promo code FEARLESS at GoodRanchers.com and save 10%. Lock in your price until 2026. Save 10% by using my promo code. What could be better than that? Support Good Ranchers. They support me, you, and us and our point of view. Uh, we're so happy to have them back on board. <clears throat> we're happy to have them back on board because I can do what I'm about to do today. I'm about to take something that's happened in the sports world and explain to you how it explains what's going on in all of America. And, and I know that some of you uh, get frustrated at the heaviness or uh, the depth of the conversations here, and, and but I'm just sorry. It's just the way that my mind works, and it's an opportunity to have a conversation with you all and to explain things to you all in a way that should be more relatable and accessible and just common amongst us. We can all look at basketball and see the changing complexion of basketball, and then we, we need to step back and ask, why is basketball changing so much? Why is the complexion of basketball? I, I, I'm, I'm not even saying the changing complexion. I'm not calling it a bad thing. I, I'm, I'm making no negative assertions. But I do want to analyze and point out to you what it's a consequence of, what it's a reflection of. Everybody wants you to get caught up in, oh, anything that happens that isn't a positive outcome for black people, well, oh my God, that must be a result of white racism. And what this show is trying to explain to you is that a lot of these negative outcomes are a result, a direct reflection of black people detaching themselves from a biblical worldview and the, the, the solutions, the uh, direction that the Bible points, we've walked away from that, and there are just an immeasurable, in, innumerable amount of negative consequences 
that result from that. And so as we've explained here on this show for th more than three years now, or going on three years now, that uh, one of the best things, if not the best thing you can do here on this planet is find a marriage partner, produce kids, and raise those kids in the fear and admonition of the Lord. That's like the, the cycle that we're supposed to repeat. And you've listened to me talk, confess numerous times about the mistakes I've made in my life, that I adopted a worldly point of view and thought that pleasuring myself in immoral ways was the best course and the funnest course of action. And, and you know, I was smarter than everybody else. The lack of responsibility, you know, was a key to my happiness and, and <clears throat> you know, hopping from one relationship to the next relationship uh, was the best thing in the world. And it's just not. There are dire consequences for that. And I just want to point out today just a small example of just some of the dire consequences. And this is less dire, you know, our, our impact and dominance of basketball is diminishing. But it is a consequence of the breakdown of our family. When, when mom and dad are not connected, the fruit that they produce is weaker than the fruit produced when mom and dad are connected in the same home, raising those kids as man and wife, as God intended them to do. And you can see it in basketball. So the theme of this show today is the black shadow. And for those of you that are young, you may not remember or have heard of the show, The White Shadow. The White Shadow was a very popular television show in the 1970s. Yeah, I believe 1970s when I was a kid. And it was about this white basketball coach, Ken Howard, who had a cup of coffee, I think, in the NBA with the Chicago Bulls. And he comes out to Los Angeles, South Central Los Angeles, and becomes a high school basketball coach at a predominantly black school. And so he's the white shadow coaching a predominantly black and Latino basketball team that I think has one or two white guys on the team. Anyway, the white shadow. That was a very popular, Any guys my age, guys over 45, everybody remembers the show The White Shadow if you were any type of sports fan. And now we've moved into the era of what I'm calling the black shadow, where again, a shadow is uh, a reflection of the larger culture, the larger deal. And so the, the white shadow isn't really the dominant force in basketball. He's a shadow. He's a shadowy figure involved in basketball. That's what's happening to us black men in the sport of basketball. We've become the shadowy figure in the background. Whereas, I'm talking about American black men. Whereas, if you go look at what we just saw in college basketball and what we're seeing in the NBA from Nikola Jokic to Luka Doncic, to Giannis Antetokounmpo, who's black, but he's from a foreign country. Joel Embiid, who's black, but he's not from the United States of America. Shea Gilgauskas, whatever. Not sure where he's from, but not the typical American. You can go all the way back to Tim Duncan. I've been talking about this process for years. And now it's come like to full fruition in college basketball. I want you guys to think about the last two nights of basketball. The last two nights of basketball, last night was about Purdue and UConn. UConn wins the national championship. <clears throat> the night before, it was about women's basketball, South Carolina versus Iowa. South Carolina wins the national championship. And we're talking about the sport of basketball. Three of those four teams, the last two nights, started predominantly white starting lineups and were dominated by white stars. Yeah, you can call, Zach Eady, I think his mom's Asian. I think he's from Canada or somewhere like that. But, but that ain't no brother. And, and y you know what uh, the left always say, what Asians basically are, and he, I think he's only half Asian, but what they basically are is 
white adjacent. His SAT score is too high to be considered uh, any, anything a minority. He can't be a person of color because his SAT score is too high, probably. That's their argument, not mine. Anyway, if you look at what we've been treated to the last two nights of best, it is a reflection of black people and black men's waning dominance in the sport of basketball, a sport we have long dominated. And this is what, and, and this will sound a bit like a pot shot <clears throat> at LeBron James, but it's just factual. This is the living legacy of the LeBron James era. Our kids, the kids that are growing up like LeBron James in single parent homes, they're not as good as basketball in mass, in total, of the black kids from previous generations, the Magic Johnsons, the Michael Jordans, of previous generations who came from two-parent homes. It's just a fact. And all of these, much of these new black American players that you are seeing emerge in the NBA, from LeVar Ball's kids to any of most of them are coming from two-parent homes. Many of them are coming from two-parent mixed-race homes. It takes two parents to properly develop and nurture a child. Are there examples where divorced parents or never married parents raise great kids? Absolutely. I would like to raise my hand, and my brother would like to raise his hand and say, hey, we're examples of that, Jason. My parents divorced when I was about five years old and my brother was eight. Both of them stayed very involved in our lives, but my parents were divorced and there was friction between them during their divorce. I'm lucky, thanks for the grace of God. Thanks for both of my parents staying involved in my life. Thanks to my grandmother, thanks to the church I was, grew up in. Thanks to all, from Jerry Stauffer to Lee Dilk to uh, Damon Furbrush to uh, <clears throat> my Uncle John and thanks to all these people, the support that I had that I didn't make a mess of my life. It, it is some higher power stepped in because, you know, I, I could have fit the statistic. But these statistics are facts. And we need to quit avoiding the reality and quit looking, oh, it's racism and it's someone used uh, the wrong word and called me boy or uh, some white kid rapped a, uh, a, a rap song and used the N-word, that's the real problem. No, the real problem is the breakdown of the family. We don't produce as good a fruit when the family is broken up the way ours is, and we have to address that, and you can see it in basketball. I wanna show you, I want you to look at the, I came up with a list of what I think are the top 10 faces of college basketball this year. And, 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 and I don't think I'm being unfair, I don't think I left anybody out, but I, I think I had them build a little graphic of the top 10 people in uh, college basketball this year. L look at that list, it's Caitlin Clark, it's Zach Eady, it's Angel Reese, it's Dalton Connect, it's Donovan Klingon, it's Kyle Filipowski, it's Hunter Dickinson, it's Juju Watkins, Paige Beckers, and R.J. Davis. Of all of those people, R.J. Davis is the only black man. Who, who, who am I leaving off? Who was the great face? Uh, who, and R.J. Davis, I'm telling you, I put him number 10 in terms of, most of y'all can't recognize him. He's a guy that played in North Carolina. And he was a fourth year senior. But this is incredible. How did we get here? That you can go through the list of the biggest 10 stars in college basketball and only one is a black man? And, and is it, are we gonna blame racism? There's more black head college basketball coaches in Division I at this time, perhaps in the history. There's certainly more than when I was growing up as a kid in the 70s and 80s. Certainly more. So you got more black men in power as head coaches 
but the faces of college basketball, the biggest stars in college basketball are all changing. Why is that? We're not developing our fruit because our family is destroyed. That's the takeaway from this entire college basketball season. Our fruit is not good right now because we haven't stayed together as a family unit. I'm, I'm not sitting here casting stones. I've made the mistake. Luckily, luck, luckily and tragically, I'm not a parent. I, as I, I, I'm not, too many people always hear me as if I'm always just pointing the finger out. And, and I'm not just pointing the finger out, I'm really pointing the finger at myself and then saying, and yeah, and all the rest of y'all are standing behind me, making the same mistakes that I made, or worse. And, and, and I'm not, for those of you that have had illegitimate kids, could have been me, as I have confessed to you all on this show. I impregnated a friend years ago. She had an abortion without my knowledge, but that's on me. I did that. And so I, I'm not sitting here pointing my finger and saying, oh, look at all you bad people. I'm talking about me too. Could have been me just as easily. Now, trust me, she had kept a baby. Trust that baby would have known her father or his father every day of his life. But anyway, so I, I just want to enter into the record for those of you that, that are so fragile and so defensive and so just afraid of addressing a real problem. I'm not distancing myself from the problem. I made all these mistakes and I'm trying to tell you all, particularly you younger people, don't make the same mistakes. Look at the consequences. And so I'm pointing out a very small consequence. Hey, our influence and dominance of basketball is waning. There are much larger consequences. There's a reason why our young black men and women are not making up any ground academically. And it's not because it's not remotely due to us being inferior. And it's not, it's not due to some racism within the educational system. It's about the breakdown of family. It's about mama and daddy. It's about being irresponsible. It's about not wearing a condom. It's about not protecting yourself. It's, not a, it's, it's about not doing marriage before carriage. These are decisions we're making. This is a culture that we think, baby mama culture, that we think has no adverse effects. We think, oh, if someone just cuts us a reparations check or provides more help or provides more sympathy or if white people break their back and bow to us, our kids' SAT scores will escalate and will be less likely to go to jail and they won't be out on the streets doing X, Y, and Z. None of that is true. If we want to fix these problems and fix the big problems, incarceration rate, academic failure, joblessness. We have to fix the family. If we want to fix the small problems, our waning influence in basketball, we have to fix the family. Virtually everything that we talk about on this show, you could see last night and you could see the last two nights and you could see all college basketball season. Like, what happened to us? This used to be our game, and now it's not. And out of desperation, out of our idolatry, now this isn't an issue that I have. I don't have this idolatry issue, but many of you do. Many, most of you do have this idolatry issue. Out of desperation and out of idolatry, black people flocked, flocked to South Carolina and Don Staley. We, we, we went from, and this is the other uh, theme I have for today. Y'all remember the movie Above the Rim? That used to define uh, black basketball culture. Remember the movie Above the Rim? Many of you have seen it, I'm sure. Well, 
The new thing we have now is below the rim. Now it's Don Staley and Angel Reese and Juju Watkins and below the rim. That's going to be the new movie that comes out because now we've all converted to Don Staley and <coughs> women's basketball. That's our savior. That's how weak we are, that we're begging Don Staley and women who can't jump over the Sunday newspaper, hey, save us. You're our new identity. We're below the rim now. Again, we used to be high flying and above the rim. Now we're below the rim. We can't dunk. We, we can't really do anything about Caitlin Clark. We're below the rim. And now Don Staley is our hero. That, that's how far we have fallen. And that's how uh, in control racial idolatry is. And that's how con in control the matriarchy is. That we as black men and black sports fans, we're looking for Don Staley to save us. And that's not me taking a dump on Don Staley. It's me taking a dump on us as men, as leaders, as a unit, as a family, whatever the, we're begging women to save us. Our identity is caught up in women who play basketball mostly at a seventh grade men's level. I'm not trying to take a dump on women's basketball, but let's just keep it real about what, we're, what we've been reduced to. And it, it's why we got to let the racial idolatry go, for one. But more important than any of that, we need to fix the black family. If our family was intact, we wouldn't be below the rim. We would still be well above the rim. But because our family is destroyed, we think, yeah, let's cape up for Don Staley. We start putting out videos. We start going on national television programs. Keyshawn Johnson. Yeah, Don Staley should be the coach of the Charlotte Hornets. Keyshawn, and, and any of you out there, I'm not trying to, to beat you up. I'm trying to wake you up to the reality of the decisions that we're making and the consequences of those decisions, the consequences of a culture that we have adopted, this matriarchal baby mama culture will have you on national TV saying Don Staley needs to be a head NBA coach. It will have the Charlotte Hornets interviewing, what's this woman's name? Lindsay Hardy, somebody none of you had never heard of until she got an interview to be the Charlotte Hornets coach. And, oh, she's G League Coach of the Year. And she used to be a WNBA player. And, and, and y'all see it as a sign of progress that she potentially is going to be an NBA head coach. That's you telling the world, we're not man enough for the job. We got to send our women in to do a job that was intended for us. Come on, man. This is weak. This is irresponsible. More than anything, it won't work. We're going... No fault. I, I'm not, and y'all have heard me blast women and black women and the, the matriarchy, but, but mostly my complaint is with us. Men, we're allowing this. Uh, we don't want the job. We can't handle the job. Give it to Lisa Hardy. No, Don Staley, she's the best candidate. She can coach men. Any, I'm not trying to dump on her, but I'm just keeping an eye. Anybody that watched South Carolina play, that, that, that's, there was not some brilliant, she wasn't out here doing a Greg Popovich. She wasn't out here doing an Eric Spolstra. They had bigger girls than everybody in the country, and they just out-rebounded everybody to a national championship. I'm sorry, that's just a factual statement. I, you know, and I know y'all, oh, he's diminishing Don, oh my God. No, I'm telling the truth.
They had a six foot seven, 280 pound woman out there that nobody could do anything about. And she created, they had to focus so much attention on stopping her. She made everybody else around her an even better rebounder as well. It is what it is. Now, I'm sorry, but it's a failure of us as men to do our jobs. And it's a, it is a failure of black women who are sitting around and have convinced themselves they don't need a black man. And, 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 and maybe in their minds they don't. Maybe they can justify that. But, but what it is, for you men out there, what you're doing to your seeds, your sons, you're killing and destroying them. Killing and destroying them. They're being feminized, raised by mamas and aunties and grandmamas and sisters and cousins. They're left in homes unsupervised, sexually exploited by some overweight woman in the neighborhood who can't get a man and give some little 12-year-old boy his first taste. We know this is going on. Don't bury your head in the sand. You got the same little cousins and relatives that I got. Unsupervised kids, when mama and dad, they're exploited. The girls and the boys, sexually exploited. We're playing well below the rim. And it's embarrassing, and we have to cut it out. This trend, this isn't a one-off. We'll have the same discussion next year. You know who's going to have the best college basketball team, according to all the reports next year? Duke. You know why they're going to have the best college basketball team? Because they got a white boy coming in, Cooper Flagg, who some think might be the, the, the best high school player since LeBron James. And he's going to be teamed with some African dude named Kaman. That's like seven foot tall. He, he's not going to, this is another freshman they got coming in. It's like seven two. They got some uh, six five white dude coming in uh, next year that, that, that they, is like the next Danny Ainge. Knudsen, I, 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 can't, I, I looked all this stuff up, but this Cooper flag, everybody's been talking about for years. He's actually reclassified a year early to get to college. He's that good. Then he left his own class to move up. He's got a twin brother that's not as good, but a pretty good player as well. But again, this Cooper flag, his mama was a basketball star at Maine University. His daddy was a basketball player at a smaller college in Maine, two parents. And they didn't produce the next little Larry Bird or whatever, and he's gonna be the star of Duke next year. And Duke's got a loaded team. They're gonna sprinkle some brothers around him, but again, one of these brothers, this seven foot two brothers come, uh, is from out of Africa or something like that. It, it, it's not American, black. It, this Cooper flag is American. And, and I'm not, I'm going to enjoy it because, again, I'm not controlled by racial idolatry. I just like to be entertained when I watch sports. But, but for those of you that have these racial idolatry issues, get ready to be on your knees begging for Don Staley to bail you out again next year. Because this men's college game, Again, we're producing bad fruit or weak fruit, fruit that's not as good as what we used to produce because our family is destroyed. The numbers, it's like a numbers game. When 80% of your kids grow up in a single parent home and your entire culture is dominated by baby mama culture and the, the depraved mentality, the ignorant mentality of hip hop culture. I, I was talking to a, a, a buddy of mine who's a, uh, I'm going to leave his name out of it for now, but you know, I, he probably wants to come on the show and talk about it. But anyway, ve ve one of my best friends in life, married to a black woman, got a, him and his wife got a bunch of black kids. Ain't, this dude ain't no sellout. Don't go there. Very involved in 
AAU summer basketball because his son was an athlete. His daughter was a, a tennis star and got a tennis scholarship. This guy has been immersed in the sports culture of young people, coaching his son and daughter and getting them all through the and, – and he tells me and says, like, flat out, Jason, uh, the problem we have with our kids is they don't want to be coached. Most of them don't have a father in the home, and so as soon as a man starts telling them what to do, they can't handle it. And they start transferring from school to school to school. This is in high school and in junior high. And then when they get to college, oh, somebody wants to tell them what to do, and it's like, I'll, I'll, let me dip in this transfer portal. When you are raising kids, and particularly boys, in homes absent of a father, and quit lying to yourself, uh, man, have you seen the studies where, uh, you know, black men, even if they're not in the home, they're more involved with their kids than white guys who are in the home? Man, they can come up with a study to tell you, and I could pay someone to come up with a study that to tell you, you know what, in reality, Jason's 170 pounds. And some of you idiots, particularly you overeducated, academic, Ivy League idiots, y'all would go on TV and say, yeah, I just got this study. Whitlock's 170 pounds. Don't believe what your eyes see. The study says he's 170 pounds. And so they came up with some study to lie to you. And say, oh, God, there's nothing wrong with uh, divorced parents or parents that have never been married. Haven't you seen the study? They've done studies for decades, decades, that show you the pipeline to prison runs directly through divorced parents or parents that were never together. That's the common denominator, white, black, or whomever's in prison, the biggest common denominator is that, yep, no daddy in the home, no daddy in the home, no daddy in the home, no daddy. Oh, he was sexually exploited in the home. Oh, uh, you know, his parents were on drugs and died. It's, it's all comes back to the family. And so when we look at what's happening in basketball, and again, this is next year, it, more than likely, the, the Zach Eady of next year will be Kansas, a seven foot two white kid named Hunter Dickinson. It, you know, he's thinking about going pro, but most of the pro scouts are like, nah, I really don't know if you built for this game. So he'll probably come back. He's probably just waiting for a bigger bag from Kansas before he announces. Maybe I'm wrong, but he sounds like another version of Zach Eady. He's, again, an All-American basketball player at Kansas, big, tall, seven-foot white guy. And he's deciding between returning to college or going to the pros. I think he's coming back. He'll do what Zach Eady did. Hey, we had an off year this year. We want to make it to the uh, championship game, he'll come back. Kansas going to surround him with a bunch of players, and he'll be the Zach Eady of next year. It's <laughs> this is so obvious what's going on, and we have to come out of the denial. We went from the black, from the white shadow to the black shadow. We went from above the rim to below the rim. And every bit of it is connected to the breakdown of the family. Any, anything, anything they tell you, oh, the infant mortality rate for black people is X, Y, and Z. And it's because of racism. No, it's because of the breakdown of the family. You put too much stress on a woman when she's outside of her role, when she's carrying too large of a burden, that baby inside her womb is, in, is at risk. They, they don't want to tell you that. They're lying to you. They're misleading you. They're making you ignore your problem. It's, again, unfortunately, I hate to be this confessional, and, and I know y'all think I'm just joking because I like to crack fat jokes about myself, but it's like it's why I force myself to get naked and look in the mirror. I got to deal with reality. It's a reminder. 
to keep that refrigerator empty, Whitlock, because you, you can't handle it. And so we have to look in the mirror and look at the results. And you can see it everywhere. You could see it in last night's basketball game. You could see it this entire college basketball season. You can see it when you turn on the NBA. When, when you watch the NBA draft in July, they got all these, they got like, I looked at the top 10, 15, it's going to be like four or five foreign guys. And, and, and again, I'm, I'm just telling you the fact. There's, in the top 10, they got like three white guys, three white American players going. Dalton Connect, the, the, the Donovan Klingon from last night, and some freshman out of Kentucky. I didn't watch much Kentucky this year. I didn't see any of them. Reed, Reed Shepard, they got beat in the first round. They got these three dudes going in the top 10. What about three or four foreign players? How many, how many spots do you think that leaves for American black dudes? If four of them are going to be foreign, three of them white boys, and again, I, I don't say that disparagingly. That's seven, according to my math, four foreigners, three white guys. That means three brothers from Americans. <laughs> Who, oh, it's racism. They hate us in the NBA. They don't want black. They don't want American black players because we're too strong and we challenge them. And the foreigners will just do what they say. And the white boys will just do what they say. And, you know, we are Black Lives Matter. We are a group of idiots. Who are sacrificing the future of our kids. Because we're being played by social media and a bunch of. Ignorant people that they install in talking head positions on all these television networks to distract you from the truth. Someone, and this is why I don't like Stephen A. Smith. Because again, remember, allegedly, allegedly, he played basketball at Winston-Salem State. Allegedly, He's an expert on basketball. That's what his brand is built around. I want you all to hop in his social media. when, Because it doesn't every day, hey, ask me, uh, tell me what y'all want me to talk about on today's uh, internet show. Ask him to talk about this and then ask him to take it to first take and talk about it on ESPN. Hey, Stephen A., what's going on with black American basketball players? Ask him to talk. He's allegedly an expert. He should be leading this conversation. He and that midget he played with, Gary Stevens, they know more about college basketball than anybody. Talk about it. It, It's an obvious issue that's not allowed to be discussed because they want you ignorant and they want you, oh boy, some white Republican Christians. They're destroying us. And man, we would dominate the NBA if it wasn't for the white Republican Christians who don't like the NBA, who don't watch the NBA. They're destroying us. Wanted to get that off my chest. Uh, We got a lot more. We're going to bring Steve Kim on, TJ Mose here in studio. We'll get their reaction here in a second. But uh, guys, I want to talk to you about My Patriot Supply. It's no longer a question of if something is coming. It's when. The only shock will be, what? Your gut, your instincts, the feeling you've had that something ominous is on the way, all of it is true. But what are you going to do about it now while you still have some control? Your first step is going to be going to my website, preparewithwhitlock.com. Your next step is stocking up on multiple one-week emergency food kits from My Patriot Supply, priced at under $50. There's no better time to buy in bulk. My Patriot Supply is equipped to help you prepare as the original Patriot Company. They've helped over 2 million families ready themselves. These one-week kits with Ready Hour Foods provide over 2,000 calories every day, and they're sealed inside a rugged ammo can so that they can last up to 25 years in storage. Just grab it and go when crisis comes. Get these kits for under $50 this week only at preparewithwhitlock.com. Preparewithwhitlock.com. 
Don't go anywhere. Let me see if I can. I, I keep one of these at the ready here. Let me see if I'm strong enough to. Yeah. I got this at home and in my office. Uh, you guys can get them. They're only 50 bucks. <sighs> Sorry for that. Uh, but anyway, you know, we try to keep it real on this show. I don't try. I don't endorse anything that I don't actually have and use and keep. Uh, preparewithwhitlock.com. All right, don't go anywhere. Uh, our good friend, your good friend, Steve Kim. Next. Hello, Fearless Army. I'm Jason Whitlock, your leader. I'm going to spend 2024 discussing growth and sacrifice. Hard times are here. Harder times are coming. What has stopped American growth and caused a regression in fundamental freedoms and values? A lack of sacrifice. Our ancestors sacrificed for our benefit. We have not sacrificed to protect the progress they died for. No sacrifice, no freedom. What impedes man's willingness to sacrifice? His ignorance, his perversion, his pride, his ingratitude, and his cowardice his rejection of God. The Bible is a story about the power and the necessity of sacrifice. Sacrifice is the sun, rain, and fertilizer of growth. Growth is our life purpose. Grow in the knowledge, wisdom, fear, obedience, and reverence to the Most High. Growth requires sacrifice will be our theme for Roll Call 2.0 this summer, June 1, right back here in Nashville. We're excited to welcome you. Let me spend a minute explaining what G-R-O-W-T-H actually stands for, for us in the Fearless Army. The G is for game plan. In order to properly grow, it's essential we work from the strategic game plan spelled out in the Bible. The R, responsibility. As we grow as men, we understand and accept our responsibilities to God, family, and teammates. The O, ownership. We embrace ownership of our destiny. Outsiders do not determine our fate. The W, wisdom. We honor, value, and share the wisdom imparted to us by elders, coaches, and leaders. The T, trust. We must be worthy of trust. The reliability of a man's word defines him far more than popularity and material possessions. The H, Humility, the reward for humility and fear of the Lord is riches and honor and life. That's straight from Proverbs 22 and four. Come join us in Nashville as we talk about growth and sacrifice and how without sacrifice, there will be no growth. Roll Call 2.0 right here in Nashville, Saturday, June 1st. Guys, are you tired of your classic rough and rigid jeans crushing your balls? Are you wearing oversized jeans that make you a laughing stock at your office or at the bar? Is your wife tired of you wearing sweats or khakis because you hate wearing jeans? Well, today's sponsor, The Perfect Jean, finally solved all of your denim difficulties. They make great looking, perfect fitting jeans that are as comfortable as sweatpants. The secret, a special denim fabric that's super soft and has the perfect amount of stretch so you can squat, do yoga, or just sit around all day in them without ever wanting to take them off. They make six six fits from skinny to thick thick and have a waist from 26 to 50 and lengths from 26 to 38. Big boys, short kings, tall dudes, and all the rest, they got you covered. I have a pair myself. I'm not thick thick anymore, but they do fit me quite comfortably. Uh, for a limited time, our listeners can get 15% off their first order plus free shipping at theperfectgene.nyc or Google The Perfect Gene and use the promo code FEARLESS15, fearless in the number 15, for 15% off. The Perfect Gene doesn't stop there, though. They've revolutionized T-shirts as well. The Perfect T has just enough stretch to hide that beer belly while accentuating your arms and chest for that flawless look. It's soft as butter without shrinking in the wash 
Like all of our other teas, it's just perfect. It's finally time to stop crushing your balls in comfortable je- in uncomfortable jeans by going to the perfectgene.nyc. Our listeners get 15% off your first order plus free shipping, free returns, and free exchanges when you use the promo code FEARLESS15 at checkout. That's 15% off for new customers at the perfectgene.nyc with the promo code FEARLESS15. After you purchase, they'll ask you where you heard about them. Please tell them here and please support our show and tell them we sent you. Forget the khakis. Get the perfect gene. All right, welcome back. TJ Mo uh, in studio with me and uh, the Korean Cosell uh, via Skype. Uh, Steve, welcome. Uh, Steve, I'm going to go to TJ first. Well, let's put the white guy on the spot first. Mm. Uh, <laughs> what do you think of... Uh, the whitening of college basketball and my theory that it's a reflection of the destruction of the black family. Well, it makes sense. You and I had this conversation off camera several weeks ago, just organically trying to sort through. Nobody would, with a clear conscience, make the argument that these white kids are more athletic than their black counterparts. No one. This... The, the uncomfortable conversation is that this obviously goes back to the slavery and breeding. I took the most athletic, best slave, most athletic, best slave. You two have kids, make me another great slave. And it happened over and over and over again. And today, you have unbelievable genes. And that's not going away. Your genetics don't just change. And these white kids aren't getting more athletic. Some of them are taller, but I, I think they're getting more skilled. Uh, I don't know. I think I see white guy. There's a dude in Iowa that's about to play cornerback in the NFL uh, who just ran a 4-4-40 uh, vertical of 38. I actually do think white guys are getting more athletic. Steve, what do you think? Well, by the way, that guy's name is Cooper DeJean, so he should do the next ad read for that company you just did. Um, here's the thing. <laughs> The style of play, and specifically what UConn did, and by the way, that was basketball. I don't know what you guys were wasting your time on Sunday, but last night I enjoyed UConn Purdue. That was <laughs> basketball played above the rim, great athleticism. But if you look at what Dan Hurley has implemented the last couple of years with that uh, high handoff, kind of the weave that they run, you have to have not just athleticism, you have to have smart basketball acumen. you got to have a floor IQ, and you have to be multidimensional and it's not just about running or jumping, which is still a requisite to play Division One basketball at the highest levels. But if you look at what was on the floor last night with guys like uh, Donovan Klingon, and then you got Cam Spencer and Alex Caraban, who I don't know if they were the best players. I mean, because the other two guys, uh, White Castle and the young man that won the MVP of the Final Four, Tristan Stewart, they were the bell cows. But I think with this Europeanization of basketball, Jason, which began what really in vogue with um, Mike D'Antoni, it has actually given a spot for players that aren't going to necessarily have the 40-inch vertical, and then you need to be able to shoot and space the floor. So I, I, I do think there are white players that are good enough athletically. That's always been the case. There just hasn't been that many of them. But during this monologue and reading your column, I heard something. Hold on. Oh, yeah, that was Gilbert Arenas and Kendrick Perkins screaming. They, they must hate what's going on, Jason. <laughs> they must absolutely hate what's going on right now. Oof, poor guys. Yeah, but they won't talk about it. I do want to – the UConn kid, I think, is Tristan Newton. Am I yeah, right? Newton. I think Newton. got the MVP yeah, last Newton. night. Uh, but I, I think three – I know three of UConn's top four scores were the white guys. Uh, you know, I, the brother led him in scoring, and then it was, I think, Cam Spencer and, and Klingon and, and the uh, Caravan, the other guy. But, but yeah, I, I do think these guys are all screaming mad. And I think, Steve, and part of my argument was that's why everybody has latched on to Don Staley and the South Carolina women. It's, it's like, 
oh my God, we don't have a team to root for in men's college basketball. So let's pretend like Don Staley is the greatest coach in history and that South Carolina is, that Don Staley's now John Thompson and South Carolina women's is, is uh, Georgetown, Hoya, Hoya Paranoia. And that, Steve, I know you'll, did you get, get in my references today? Uh, guys, show, let's put up on screen, I want to show Steve the uh, below the rim graphic, you know, because we've, what, what's happened with men <laughs> with basketball for black people is we went from above the rim to now below the rim. Uh, and we've gone from the black, uh, white shadow to the black shadow. You know, Don Staley is now, what was his name? Ken Reeves in, in the white shadow. Uh, and so everything's just been flipped upside down. We're rooting for below the rim basketball and we're rooting for the black woman coach to come in and save us. God, Ken Reeves from Boston College. What a show that was. But yeah, maybe Jason, <laughs> me and you are from the same era. And there are always like these iconic teams that if you're kind of unattached and you wanted to be a Subway alum, as they say, that inner city or black America or guys like me who are younger, who are kind of rebellious, we either loved Georgetown in the 80s and then it shifted to UNLV for a couple of years during the Larry Johnson, Stacey Ogman, Anderson Hunt days, and Greg Anthony. And then it became Michigan with the Fab Five. And you're right, you bring up a great point. Now it seems as though those transient fans are latching on to women's basketball. And here's the hypocrisy of it, though, Jason. I can honestly tell you, growing up all those years, from the early 80s, when I first saw Georgetown, 1982, when Patrick Ewing, a young freshman, who used to wear a T-shirt underneath his jersey. We need to bring that back, another thing. So from 82 to about 93, which is the last year when the Fab Five broke up, right? I can honestly tell you, I think most of us, Jason, watched those games throughout the year. We watched Big Monday. We watched the big Saturday afternoon game. We watched the big Sunday games. Um, I still remember when Patrick Ewing and Ralph Sampson they actually played each other, I believe, in Ewing's sophomore year. The game was syndicated nationally. So it became like this boxing match. I still remember watching it in Valencia, California on a Saturday night. So we can honestly say we followed this team. I think this is hypocritical to say, Don's our girl. We're Staleyites. Right. How many games did you watch? How many games do you think they actually watched prior to the month One. of <laughs> one, maybe two. No, no, no they only four. watched one. Okay. They yeah, only the watched her against right. Caitlin Clark. Right. <laughs> well, so this became like the women's basketball version of Jerry Cooney, Larry Holmes, unfortunately. And, and I just have a question for all of these people now jumping on the South Carolina women's basketball bandwagon. How many games will you watch next year? <sighs> Not many. I would suspect. Uh, and, but again, it's also they have to lie to themselves in terms of, oh man, that was thrilling. That was awesome. <laughs> it, it, no, it's, it's people getting put back buckets, put back buckets because they got a six foot seven, 280 pounder. But, but Steve, I, I'm going to, and I wasn't planning to make this point, but as I just sit here and think it through, and this is for you or TJ to react to, or I can just react to it myself because it may be a little more difficult for you all, but you guys aren't afraid of anything. I'm going to connect this whole desperation to why everybody desperately jumped on the Deion Sanders bandwagon again. It, it, it's like we're in such a weakened, insecure place that we will toss the label of greatness and you're the new in thing. Remember, I mean, last football season, people were saying, has Colorado become black America's team? Mm -hmm. Co in the whitest city in America. <laughs> whitest city in America. No one knows anything about Colorado football. And just overnight, Dion shows up and a rapper or two are on the sidelines. And now it's black America's team. And that's exactly what just happened to South Carolina basketball. Uh, women's basketball. I was like, out of desperate, well, we got nothing in uh, men's college basketball. And Nikola Jokic, he's dominating the NBA, and LeBron James is is on fumes right now. And, you know, they, they need to, uh, what is it? Is it EPA, whatever they're doing to us? <laughs> they say, whatever. <laughs> we need to get that everywhere. 
it's a desperate look. We just jump from team to team to team, and oh my God, Dion's a great coach. Well, no, he's not. And 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 I'm sorry, and I know people. If you stick to the show long enough, I'm going to backtrack and apologize on some things related to Don Staley or be more graceful on some things to Don Staley. But I got to see some real coaching before I'm ready to call her a great coach. This is all Uh-oh. desperate. I don't care what the record says. I don't care what the record says. I know great coaching when I see it. And I know – and let me just be crystal clear. If anybody really looked into my past, Steve Fisher – I covered the Fab Five teams. I lived in Ann Arbor, Michigan, worked for the Uh Ann Arbor paper. I used to crush Steve Fisher, crush him, that he could not coach. And at that time, he couldn't. He turned into a great coach at San Diego State. But they won all them games, and I was crushing him. So any of you Johnny-come-latelys, how can he be critical of Don State? Because this is the exact same thing I did to a white coach that had – four NBA players on the team and could roll a basketball out there and make it to the NCAA championship game without any coaching. That's just what I do. It checked my receipts. But anyway, I I just think it's a bad, desperate look the way we're jumping from team to team. I think um, you and Shmink were talking about this on the call the other day. Steve, do you you, uh, look around and figure out where the Asians play and then root for that team? Because I I don't do that with white people. Yeah, that's like looking for a dodo bird right now. When it comes to basketball, we had Jeremy <laughs> Lenz for about 15 it. minutes, and then Carmelo Anthony yeah. came back off the injured list, and Lynn Sanity was over. It's over for us. That's it. <laughs> it's, I, th- there's something about it, you know. Remember uh, Oscar So White and the White Lash and all yeah. these different things. You could actually make the case that Caitlin Clark is facing a black lash, and that the reality is black people don't like white stars very much, and. It, Jump around. Whoever the white star is, the greatest thing in the world is who the opposition is. And I, I don't operate that way. Maybe other white people do. I haven't seen it. Let me ch- I don't disagree with you because I know you well. But here's what the audience is saying. Uh, TJ, you, you didn't care about women's basketball until Caitlin Clark showed up. What, mm. what, she was the best player. The only one I ever cared about. Yeah. Sh- show mm. me a black woman that's as good as Caitlin Clark. Jimmy, Jimmy an Watkins. Asian woman that's as good as... Drew Watkins is what, you know, she's not. But I watched her this year, and I told you I was a fan of her. But she wasn't good enough to get my attention in the first place. Neither was Caitlin as a freshman. Caitlin took mm. until she was two and a half years in before I even heard her name. Juju's been around for five minutes. Maybe if she was good enough. And Look, I, I knew the <laughs> name of Candace Parker and some of these others, and most of them, were, I knew Diana Taurasi, but that's because I was you know, an 11-year-old watching Sports Center on repeat. And Diana Taurasi, even back then, they were trying to push women's basketball. And so I, I've heard all these. I'm just telling you, nobody was a fan of, of women's basketball, black or white, until Caitlin Clark came around. And then the black people mm-hmm. said, I hate her. And, and all the jealous lesbian white women also said, I hate her, and rooted against her. And then the other people who didn't operate under racial idolatry said, this is fun for the first time ever. I might watch this. Babe. Hmm. Well, first of all, I'm the realest guy here because I didn't care before Caitlin Clark. I didn't care during Caitlin Clark. <laughs> and I'm certainly not going to care after Caitlin Clark. So call me Evander Holyfield. I'm the real deal here. <laughs> CJ, let me get to a couple points here. The Oscar so white was bizarre because my, my view is if you didn't care about it, you shouldn't have made such a big deal. If it is a whitewashed award uh, rooted in white supremacy, You know, create your own awards, do your own thing. And why do you need recognition and awards from the very same people you claim are your oppressors? Now, Jason, to your point about Steve Fisher, you're absolutely right. There was a lot of criticism over the Fab Five that essentially Steve Fisher was very lucky that Bill Frieder quit when he did or was let go because Bo Schembechler said, oh, no, 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 no. We want a Michigan man coaching Michigan. If you want to go to Arizona State, get out of there. And Michigan at that point was recruiting big-time talent throughout the 80s with Glenn Rice and all those other guys. And I remember Bill Walton the said judge, this team does Antoine not – Antoine Jobert. Antoine Jobert, Gary Grant, Roy Tarpley. And they would always choke in the first round of the playoffs early on. But I remember in one of those years, it had to be Weber and Rose's sophomore year – Bill Walton got into a lot of trouble because he was honest. He said, that team looks unorganized and uncoached. And, Bill, it's interesting. The one team they could never beat, even though this team only had one NBA guy, was 
Indiana and Bob Knight. They had Cal Chaney. Cal Chaney was the one guy athletically and skill-wise that could be on the floor, but every single time those two played, and I hated Indiana back then, and I wanted them to get blown out. The last seven minutes of each game was an intellectual blowout when it came to thinking the game. So, Jason, you were absolutely spot on about Coach Fisher at that point in time. One of the most controversial things I ever wrote in Ann Arbor that, like, really pissed the Fab Five off, pissed Steve <laughs> Fisher off, is I did a breakdown, and I can't remember who the third team was, but it was Duke, Indiana, and one other team that they just had a horrible record against, against those three teams. And they were all, it was basically them against well-coached teams. <laughs> and I can remember uh, Indiana was coming to Chrysler Arena, and I wrote this article and did this whole breakdown. And, and did the article was about how it won't matter, because Jalen Rose had this fetish about when he was on the court, how much of his jersey would hang out and where his shorts sat on his butt. And you could, because again, I mean, I'm covering the team going to practices, I go to every game, and you can just see like, oh my God, this guy is obsessed. He's constantly pulling his jersey out just enough that it's hanging just perfectly. And I can remember writing like, this game against Indiana won't be decided on how low Jalen Rose's shorts sit on his rear end, how much of his jersey's untucked. <laughs> it's going to revolve around whether he's going to get back on defense. But, and I just called him out in the biggest way possible. And it's the only time Steve Fisher remotely liked me because they all this came out before the game. They all read it, and they played their best game against Indiana. But Bobby Knight, yeah, he owned them. And I can remember earlier in that year they had went to Bloomington and lost. And I stood behind Bobby Knight, not Bobby Knight, one of his assistants. Forget the, it was a well-known assistant, and he was talking to a recruit after the game. And they were looking up at the scoreboard, and he, he was telling the recruit that, hey, man, it don't matter how high, he was, and it was a white recruit. It don't matter how high you can jump. <laughs> don't matter how uh, this or that, how well you dunk the basketball. If you just do the things we say, you'll have success here at Indiana. Yeah, well. And he was making his, <laughs> he was clearly taking a pot shot at Michigan in the yeah. Fab Five, mm -hmm. and the, the recruit was eating it all up, and I wrote about it. Anyway, Steve, go ahead. You had something else you wanted to? Yeah, one of the famous lines from Bobby Knight in a 60-minute feature they did in the early 80s, and this is when he was at the peak of his powers. He said, look, when you come to Indiana, you're going to play basketball my way, not your way. Okay, the bottom line is very simple. There's a way to play basketball. We do it correctly here. You have no say in this because I've forgotten more about this than you're ever going to know, and it was the truth. One last note on Jalen Rose. I don't mean to pick on him, but, Jason, I've always blamed him for the timeout, the inadvertent or unfortunate timeout of Chris Weber because if you go back to that game, Carolina misses a free throw. Weber gets the rebound. As a point guard, you got to run up to that guy and say, give me the ball. He ran away from the ball. He put Weber in a tough situation. Who traveled, got away with it. He panicked. But I've always thought Jalen Rose, as a point guard, the intelligent play was to run up to that guy and say, okay, give me the ball. I'll run this. He didn't. I was sitting courtside for that game. Mm -hmm. What an incredible moment. <sighs> uh, Pains me. Pains me. I, I, I feel sorry. I think it, it, it limited Chris Weber's NBA career. Uh, hmm. That shadow hung over him. And this is really? before, obviously, social media. It would have been worse if it had been in the social media era. But it became what he was known for. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it just hovered over him. Could have been, you know, part of his problem in the NBA was just he went on this, which he would say was the right thing, but he lost a bunch of weight. So that he wouldn't, because Don Nelson wanted to play him at center in Golden State, and he wanted yeah. nothing to do with playing center. And so he lost a bunch of weight, so he he couldn't play center. Uh, Chris Weber was too smart for his own good as a basketball player, uh, <laughs> and just he did too much thinking. And so that timeout, it ate his mind up. He just couldn't let it go. And uh, anyway, Chris, a, a good kid. Good grown man. Uh, hey guys, could have been probably even better basketball player. 
not for anyway. Go ahead, Jason T. I have a question. Did you guys actually watch last night's game, the finals? Yeah, yeah. While I was dozing off. Uh, yeah. It was literally yeah. the second or third game I watched all year. I was at Coach JB's house because I keep my promises, Whitlock. See again, you didn't show up to Coach JB's <laughs> final four Palooza. Uh, death taxes and Jason Whitlock reneging on promises to go out here. Okay, but anyway. <laughs> I will give UConn credit. That's a hell of a basketball team. They're well coached. They're fun. They play well. Mm -hmm. And what I like about this, even this age of the NIL and the transfer portal, just watching them react on the bench, that's a team that plays for one another. They play well together. They share the ball. And I said, you know what? This can still exist if you have a strong enough culture. And I said, they should be proud of themselves. And if I'm Danny Hurley, uh, there's no way I leave to Kentucky. I'm already at Camelot. But I'll be honest with you guys. I watched the game because I thought we might talk about it. But I'm at the stage now with college basketball. I only really watch the game to watch one shining moment at the very end. That still gets me. I still love the song. Still love Teddy <laughs> Pendergrass. And then now, as soon as it's over, I just turned the channel. I said, okay, I don't have to talk about this for another year. All right. You brought me to two other points, Steve. Uh, and one is a small one, but I do – since you're mentioning One Shiny Moment, did you watch the pregame version of One Shiny Moment that featured Terry Crews giving a speech about his high school basketball career, and then they showed Magic Johnson, Grant Hill, uh, Isaiah Thomas, uh, somebody else, and Candace Parker. They worked Candace. Did, did no one saw this? Yeah, this is. I'm and the glad whole, I didn't. Candace. Know. The, yeah, literally, that, that's that, that's because Terry yeah. Crews was the dominant. Terry Crews gave this gate, great speech about uh, being in this high school basketball game to win a championship or something, and he had this wide open layup. He stole the ball and was going in, and he said he started thinking about his celebration and what hitting this basket was going to do, and me, and he missed the shot, and it cost his team mm -hmm. the championship. And 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 the, you know it was it was a great job by Terry Crews and and you know I follow Terry Crews kind of closely. We played football against each other in college, and so mm. I like that. And then they transitioned into Magic and Isaiah and Grant and a couple other people. And then they mixed Candace Parker into this, and she's wearing a tie and she's got this hair, and it's like. Mm. They, most of the audience is like, who is this? And mm -hmm. is it, literally they're wondering, is, is this some male that transitioned into a, <laughs> oh, God, was some former? And I'm serious. It's like, and again, I, it took me a second. This is like, why are they forcing this woman into this? Like she's giving a speech to these players and, and they, but anyway, that was a bit woke for me and I didn't like it. The last part that I want to, I do want to spend a little time on before I let you go, Steve. You just made the point about UConn and mm. how they play for each other and how well coached they are and blah, blah. It connects to my bigger point, and, and I'm so glad you reminded me because I, I didn't include it at the top, and, and I, I, it's a big part of my point. The mentality of victimhood, I don't want it on my team, in my locker room, if I'm a coach, if I'm a teammate, that mentality of I'm – a victim and I'm oppressed. None of that works. And that's why Purdue and UConn, because Purdue got beat by a 16 seed last year, but they were one, one or two last year as the best. These have been the best two teams the last two or three years. Mm -hmm. And they've been built around, I'm just sorry, a white nucleus and <laughs> of non victims. And what my buddy was talking about that I mentioned earlier about how, like, these kids are impossible to coach. And it's hard to coach victims. Mm. And kids that are always looking for, oh, you did this to me because I'm black. Or you, did this, you didn't do it to this other guy. And if you build a nucleus around guys that don't have a victim mentality, you can then coach and then you can then put in a system and that's what we're seeing. And that's someone made the point that that's what John Calipari is going to have to learn in this yeah. next iteration of himself, that the one and done era and just rolling out a bunch of talented first round picks and, and just make it 
it doesn't work anymore, there will be some teams with strong nucleuses of, uh, that have been together for a while and have some real chemistry and, and have the right mentality that the teams that are just thrown together aren't going. And that's what we've seen in Purdue and UConn. And, and that just kind of wraps up my whole narrative from today about the victim mentality that destructed families buy into is killing black men's dominance in basketball. Hmm. Jason, you, you look at Hurley, and his father is a legendary coach, Bobby Hurley Sr. Uh, they've done documentaries on him, uh, the work that he's done at St. Anthony's in New Jersey, producing hundreds of college players, a few guys that made the league. And he's a hard man. He's a hard, tough man who was not going to be soft on his players, and he was not going to be a player's coach, and I'm sure that's probably handed down to his sons, Bobby and Danny. So that doesn't surprise me. And Matt Painter's been there for 19 years. If I'm not mistaken, I believe he played with Glenn Robinson in the mid-'90s. I, I remember him. He was a pretty good role player for Gene Cady. But I get the sense that Purdue says, hey, we're going to have a culture here. We're going to be about the school and the program because – I think they're realistic about it. Glenn Robinson's only coming to their program once every 30, 40 years. That's just the way it is. Okay. But John Calipari to me in Kentucky is a cautionary tale that if you just want to rent an NBA first round draft choice for six months and then throw them all together and think you're going to develop a culture. And then even then, Jason, even though you know this guy's going to leave you in four months, you're not allowed to coach them hard. You're not allowed to really set down any type of parameters. What did we think was going to happen here across the board? The erosion, as they say, was gradual, and then it was sudden for Calipari. So this is where I actually think the your point earlier about, listen, these young black kids don't want to be coached. They won't let you coach them. Uh, this is where I actually think college basketball may be one of the few places where the white guys having less talent actually works in their favor. If you look at the roster from last night, Tristan Newton's a grad student. Uh, Cam Spencer's a grad student. That's two of the top scorers on UConn from yesterday. And then they had uh, Klingon's a sophomore, and then they had one freshman. That was the top four guys. So you have experienced guys that have been there four or five years, not talented enough to go transfer around. And well, no, I think Spencer was a transfer, but to, to go get plucked out in the first or second round. They're telling that white kid from uh, Kansas, yeah, you probably need to stick around. These young black kids got so much raw athletic talent that they've been talking to NBA guys. They can get plucked out. These white kids got to stick around and make a team out of it. Yes, that, that's a factor. But the other factor is if you come from a single parent home, you got pressure at home. And I know they're making NIL money now, but you got to make money as soon as you can and as much as you can get you a shoe contract, get you whatever. And so if you're coming from a two-parent home, now nah, your, your dad, your mom, nah, stick around, enjoy your college experience. You'll be fine. We, we've, you know, remember we saved a bunch of money for you to go to college that we didn't have to spend because you got a college scholarship. We'll give you that as a down payment on your house when you and your girl get married, okay. blah, blah, blah. All these kind of things that, again, there's all these consequences to a dest destructed family. <laughs> Steve, I do want to correct you on one thing because I'm like, you were testing, yeah. I'm an Indiana boy, you were testing my Indiana knowledge, and I was like, nah, Matt Painter's closer to my age, and my, my memory's right. Uh, Painter did not play with... Uh, oh, he didn't, okay. Glenn no, Rose. no, 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 my memory's wrong. My memory's wrong. He did play a year or two uh -huh. uh, with Glenn Robinson. He may have been there, yeah. Glenn Robinson's well, uh, senior year. That's, question yeah. the Kimster. That's why I'm here. Never works For out the, well. For the Purdue history. Let me think it through okay? again. For the Purdue mm. history. That's what I bring to the table here. Purdue Is, history. <laughs> hold on. Hold on. Because, yeah, I think you're right. He may have played one year with him. And it, Glenn just, Robinson is just older. Teammate. Yes. Yeah. Glenn Robinson is just older than what I remember. Yeah. His, yeah, Glenn Ro yeah, he did. He did. Glenn mm. Robinson's older like than it. I remember. Glenn Robinson's 51. I was thinking he was 48. -ish. Steve Kim's in the hey, Jason. Not in women's basketball, though. Tell us about Purdue women's yeah. basketball. 
they play. That's they won all a national hey, championship. But, they won TJ, a national championship before. <laughs> TJ, to your point about the, the racial dynamics now basketball, there used to be a thing in the NBA with Bill Russell. He once said, yeah, the old NBA was kind of segregated even when we had black players, but there was a rule. You play three black guys on the court um, if you're on the road. You play four of them if you're at home. Now, if you're behind, you play all five. Okay, so that's how much has changed. So now, so next year, I'm going to actually fill out a bracket, TJ. We're going to have to go through this. So as we fill out this bracket of teams I've never watched, I'm going to actually go through this, have one of our research. I'm like, all right, how many old white guys above the age of 20 does this team have? And if a team has more than two or three white guys that are above the age of 20 that are upperclassmen, just keep advancing them, and odds are you might win that bracket without ever watching a game. Well, did y'all see Dave Portnoy's bet? Yes. Mm, <laughs> Holy you see that, Steve? Oh, boy. Yeah, I did. Oh, boy. Did you see? <laughs> yeah. Unbelievable. That was. Yeah. Bet 600 grand won 2.7 million. Yeah. That's a pretty good bet. Now, mm-hmm. to his credit, he does show us when he loses because he loses a he lot. Does? Oh, yeah. Well, oh, let's say this. Uh, people report on when he loses, minimally, because gotcha. he loses a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. Was, that's He said it's his biggest win ever, and he's probably still down several million. <laughs> yes, he is. Anyway. All right. Thank you, Steve. Uh, we got to go. Uh, guys, uh, making sure you have fruits and vegetables in your diet is important for maintaining a healthy diet, but it can also be difficult, especially if you're busy. The average person doesn't even eat half of the recommended servings in a day. That's a huge gap in nutrition and inflation has seriously increased the cost of fruits and vegetables. That's why Balance of Nature provides an on-the-go solution, and they haven't raised their prices for 10 years. Their proprietary blend of 31 fruits and vegetables come in easy-to-swallow capsules and will give your body so much of of the nourishment it needs. Imagine trying to eat 31 different kinds of produce in a single day. Well, that's what you're doing when you get Balance of Nature fruits and veggies. When you go to balanceofnature.com, you'll get 35% off plus $10 off any additional sets with your first order as a preferred customer by using my discount code FEARLESS. That's a limited time, limited offer, limited to five sets, but you'll save a ton of money while you're getting the fruits and vegetables you need in your diet. Go to balanceofnature.com and use my promo code FEARLESS for 35% off. That's balanceofnature.com. Promo code FEARLESS. All right, don't go anywhere. Uh, Steve Kim and I are going to reset, not Steve Kim and I, TJ Moe and I are going to reset the conversation about Don Staley and the sincerity of her faith based on a new Daily Beast article. We'll do that next. Back to beef as I walk you through uh, my top 50 media beefs of all time. Yeah, I'm an equal opportunity beefer. It's like, Randy, are you asleep at the wheel? Big lips are in style. I'd love to squash this beef. I mean, I was not real happy at all. I, I, I was less than thrilled. I was displeased. And now we have beef. Welcome back, uh, Jason Whitlock, TJ Moe. Yesterday, TJ, we had a pretty lengthy discussion about uh, Don Staley and the sincerity of her faith, and she made a lot of statements after the game, on the court, on the stage, and I think even in the press conference. I was skeptical of them, and... and um, Wondering, like, hey, where's all this coming from? Is this a smokescreen? The Daily Beast uh, has published a story about Don Staley and uh, her proclamations about faith. Let me see if, yep, here we go. Call this up here. They're upset with Don Staley. Mm -hmm. Uh, The NCAA's hoops coach might be violating her players' religious freedom. Uh, This is Frankie Della. Kretz or whatever, some woman that works for the Daily Beast. And so when I first saw this story, I, my reaction was, this is part of the gimmick. The, the left is pretending like they're upset with Don Staley. But then I read the story, 
And I have to admit, I was unaware that Don Staley had been making these types of statements since I believe 2021, then on into 2022. She, a year or so ago, she blocked me from her Twitter feed, so I don't get to see what she tweets out about. Uh, and so she tweets out a lot of times during the season her daily devotionals before games. And, and reading this story, I started to go, well, hold on. I, I, may, be, I may have judged too harshly. Uh, there may be more sincerity here than I'm giving her credit for. And, and I have to be willing to say, like, okay, she's dead wrong on this transgenderism, and she needs to understand that. But when people start leaning into their faith, perhaps later in life, or when they start leaning into a deeper understanding of their faith later in life, they have some conflicts. They have some things they haven't quite figured out yet, but maybe she's on the path to figuring it out. And so I, I just, you've read the story, same as me. Uh, does this give you a different point of view or more grace uh, as it relates to Don Staley? Yeah, I think so. And I like your point about her age. She's 53. So she yeah. started doing this when she's 51 years old, maybe 50. Uh, at this point, still single, searching. And she's been one thing that I actually appreciate, and we talked about this a little bit yesterday, but it's she's not dancing around that she's a Christian. Like on Easter, I didn't catch this until the story. She said at the end of her press conference, he is risen. So she's very clear that she believes in the God of the Bible. She says, thank you, Jesus. She, she attempts to quote scripture and says, this is found in the Bible. I do appreciate that. She's no theologian. When you read the story, like on her devotion, devotionals, it'll say Jesus versus North Carolina. And it, as though Jesus is on their side, you know. And so <clears throat> let me throw, don't stop, but just let me throw this in. She's an uncovered woman. She needs to be studying a Bible under the discipleship of a man. And so that's why I think she's potentially struggling. She's trying to do it alone. Hats off to her, I wanna be supportive. When she gets deeper into the Bible, she'll understand she needs to be doing, and maybe she belongs to some church and there's some elder, minister, or whatever that's helping her, but, but if she's making some mistakes, it's probably because she's an uncovered woman, she's not married to a man, she's not in that relationship. And again, part of my grace and part of why I'm backpedaling and apologizing is like, oh man, she's going through the same thing that I'm going through. She's made a bunch of mistakes, and, and this will sound funny, but I'm just keeping it real. Does she got the same problem I got? Does she like young women? Is, is, is that the <laughs> issue? Do we share the same problem? Yeah. And and, uh, and 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 I'm sympathetic towards her uh, for for that for that reason. It's like, oh man, I'm starting to recognize the struggle. And and so anyway, continue. No, I, I'm I'm so I'm right there with you. That the, the hardest thing at any age is you've experienced it. You'd speak this better than probably anybody that I know. To go from a somewhat private faith, at least on a scale that you're doing it now, to saying. I'm gonna take a step forward today, and I'm, in my press conference, I'm gonna say something about it. That's actually a big step. And so she may have it all wrong. In fact, I think she's got a lot of it wrong based on what I'm reading in this Daily V story, although uh, if I take this at face value, it'd be the first thing I've ever taken at face value that came out of the Daily V. So I, I don't know necessarily what to believe from them. But if she's trying to take steps, you told me yesterday, I actually didn't know this, it, it's just assumed that she's a lesbian and that she's never actually come out and said that that's something that she, believes in or, you know, whereas, I mean, I was, Candace Parker used to be married to Sheldon Williams, and now she's like, yeah, by the way, I'm a lesbian. You never thought yes. of it. So most of these girls are out and out about it. it. It struck me as kind of weird that she's not. She is a coach, and so if she was out of the closet with her, it would lock her out of some homes. And, it, it, and particularly, there's some black mamas that would, you know, they can co-sign a bunch of stuff that's left and immoral, 
but they draw a little sign, a uh, line in the sand over sexuality. Hmm. Yeah, I got I got people like that in my family. They, they're good with almost virtually every sin, except except for then they'll draw a line. Oh my God, you know, their kids can deal drugs, they can do anything, but <laughs> don't you be no lesbian. <laughs> <Don't> you, <laughs> <that's> no, <laughs> are there any openly lesbian coaches? I'm sure there are, mm -hmm. but for a black woman that relies on uh, single or black other black women to deliver their kids to them, it's just a bit more ticklish. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I you know, isn't Tara Vanderveer the Stanford coach? There, there's a lot of them that I think seem to be comfortably out of the closet. She comfortably dresses that way. Yes, she does. So, I mean, it's, it's not a big secret as far as yes. the way she presents herself. It's like you could see with Diane Taurasi didn't have to tell me she was a lesbian. Yes. She just needed to dress like that on yes. television and, and you knew. But what that, where I'm going with that is that perhaps all of that has just been a struggle for her. Yes. And so if, if she's authentically fighting against her own sin, I don't have a problem in the world with her. I look, I will fight with you. I will hopefully constructively criticize when you have your issues with the transgender stuff and the racial idolatry and the stuff that when you step in it, we're all going to step in it. But if she's authentically fighting against her own sin and trying to authentically move her players and disciple them as best she can as a head coach, I got no problem in the world with her. I, I still find some of it kind of hard to believe, but there's more history here than I was anticipating, before, you know, as we talked about yesterday. Hard to believe what, 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 Explain, elaborate on that. I don't find it hard to believe that she cares and believes there is a God. I find it hard to believe she's fighting against her sin authentically and that she doesn't think this other stuff is fine. The racial idolatry and the transgender stuff. I don't, I don't, I don't know that she's identifying, here's where I am today, but I know I got to get over these hurdles. I, I, I think she's probably not there. She's not. She's in a tough spot. This is like the spot that I see a lot of churches get into. In ter there's a lot of things churches will ignore or justify because they're saying, look at all the good I'm doing. And so, oh my God, if, if, if we dealt with the fact that our minister's a heretic and he's sleeping with every woman in the church, do you understand how many kids wouldn't get backpacks and wouldn't have the after school program mm -hmm. and we wouldn't be able uh, to pay for so-and-so's medical bills and blah, blah, all this good we're doing in the community. But if we address that the pastor is, you know, sleeping with a dozen different women in the church, man, do you know how many people that would hurt? And so they just overlook it. And, and, and so Don Staley said, look at this. I, I'm inspiring so many people as a coach and making women think that they can be leaders and, you know, I'm helping this girl and that girl, and if you only knew, if it wasn't for me, what this girl that was on the team, what her life, and so they just justify, and 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 I, I find it all very relatable, and and so I want to be man enough uh, to come on this show and say, oh man, I I I think I had the wrong narrative on Don Staley, I, I'm not. Sure, if I'm completely wrong, but I know I need to be more sympathetic, yep. and 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 you know, literally, I, I, I you know, again, I, Don's blocked me on uh, Twitter. Uh, I'm sure she doesn't like me, but Don, I, I want to apologize and and say that uh, you know, I want to take a step back and and you know, look from afar and, and just evaluate what's going on. And if uh, anybody on this show or anybody can be an asset to you in your walk uh, and be more sympathetic about your walk, uh, I'm certainly willing to do that. I, I, the, the transgender stuff, I think, you know, caught her with her pants down in terms of there's no way she was expecting someone to ask that question because everybody knows the rules. You know, don't ask them anything uncomfortable if you want to keep access. And so she knew it was a big question. I don't, clearly I don't like her answer, particularly if she's on this faith journey. And so her best answer should have been, hey, I'm not gonna deal with that right now. We can, I'll have a longer conversation after the season or something if you want. That would have been the best answer. Uh, she gave the absolute wrong answer. Uh, 
that's probably to protect her spot, mm-hmm. not deal with the blowback that would have come with that. And, and again, that, that's, it's tough, man. When you walk, it's a very narrow path. Mm-hmm. And you're going to lose a lot of friends uh, if you really go down this path. Why is the road of destruction? Yeah. What I would, the, the one thing I would add to this <clears throat> is that, and I, I hit on this yesterday a little bit, we, we do have serious jobs as Christians now to hold her accountable to this Bible because Revelation 3.16 says, so because you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. And so if you think you can live in sin and play this, only I'm the vocal Christian, but over here I'm going to live this potentially lesbian lifestyle. I'm going to support this transgender, anti-God narrative. I'm going to... Uh, you know, live in this racial idolatry, and that's totally fine, and you're going to co-sign that. That's what I thought of when you were talking about the, the church does a lot of this. Well, here's the good things we're doing. Those good things aren't going to get you anywhere. That's, that's not going to put you in a, you know, you can do, there, there's a lot of really good people by our standards that are living in hell today. And so that our job as Christians then would be to move her out of that and hold her to this standard and say, these positions that you hold are antithetical to the biblical positions that you claim to follow. So how do we reconcile these things? And because of the position she's in, she's so powerful at South Carolina and within the sport of basketball, she's probably just not getting challenged much. And, and uh, having known some people uh, in the basketball world that have had some dealings with her, you know, she wields her power very effectively and can bully people and, and you know, but. It, it's mistakes we can all make. And, and she certainly as it relates to racial idolatry and like what she did to BYU, what she did to Lisa Bluter. Again, this is why I go back. She's uncovered, man. If she had a husband to talk to and, and who was a believer and, you know, had some real hard line understanding, like a husband, baby, no, no, we're we not doing that to Lisa Bluter. Cut that out. Mm-hmm. And we're not going to do this to this BYU people. Mind your business. Coach your team. Uh, leave BYU alone. Uh, pray for that little Rachel girl that, you know, started this. But, but when you're uncovered and you're out there, you're making your own decisions and you got, you know, it, it, it's rough. You're going to make it. Not that men don't make the same mistake because she do. She watch it. You know, Stephen A. says he has some faith. And he was the ringleader trying to lynch the people out of BYU. Remember, he's got, Stephen A's calling a minister, hey, I'm about to cuss Jason Whitlock out and do some of the most unchristian things I can. I just want to tell my minister that up front. Yeah. Well, again, Stephen A's making a fool out of Christianity, making a fool out of his minister, setting a horrible example. It is, you know. And we can all do that. And this is something that you've acknowledged when, when we had uh, Gabe on the show. Like, this is why we're a pair, because men are supposed to be the leaders of the relationship. Gabe Rent, you're talking about. Gabe Rent, thank you. Yeah. And women, there, there's a reason Bible, the Bible identifies wisdom and calls it by her. And so women should be able to speak in and help the man lead. But the man needs to lead. And so you need to be able to give instruction. And so single people have it harder. It's a tough deal. I know a lot of, take my sister. She's a leader in her career and she's had a bunch of leadership positions in corporate America. It's hard for them to turn that off when they come home. Mm-hmm. So here's Don Sadie, a basketball coach. She's a leader 24-7. Hard, you know, hard for her to turn it on and off, particularly when you're uncovered. My sister's been married three times. You know, she throws off the coverings. I'm sorry, yo, yo. <laughs> but, <laughs> she, she throws off the covering every time. She, <laughs> Don, Don's not married. She doesn't even have anything to throw off. I, I mean, when you're a single woman, you, you have to lead yourself. You don't have a choice. She's in a, she's in a hard spot. And again, perhaps she's doing the best thing she can. That The Bible doesn't explicitly say it is sinful to want to sleep with a woman. It is sinful to engage in the act of sleeping with a woman. And so perhaps, I doubt it, but perhaps she's saying, I don't like men, so I'm staying out of it. But I'm not going to go out there and parade around as some sort of lesbian and, and also quote this Bible. Those two things aren't going to work. Don, uh, I apologize and uh, we'll be taking a closer look and, and trying to evaluate and help if we can. Uh, 
Uh, last thing before we go, I want to plug. Hey, we've got a series coming out here at The Blaze. Have you ever wondered uh, just exactly how it is that our politicians enter into public service making moderate salaries, but then end up walking away with an astonishing amount of money? Where are all these tens of millions of dollars coming from? And while they're busy earning all that money, who's actually doing the job we sent them there to do in the first place? We all learned from an early age that the best way to get rich in America was to get a degree, start a business, or maybe take a job on Wall Street, to work hard and save even harder so that we could make a better life for ourselves and for our children. Turns out, <laughs> it's way easier than that. All you have to do is get, elect get elected to Congress. Join us tomorrow, 8 p.m., Wednesday, Eastern, for a live pre-show event hosted by Glenn Beck, J James Paulus, followed by a live premiere of Bought and Paid For, how politicians get filthy rich streaming live on YouTube and Blaze TV. Head on over to youtube.com slash, slash at Blaze, Blaze TV to watch the live event. Subscribers can watch on Blaze TV. Go back, I wanna, I wanna give that address one more time just so I'm crystal clear. Head over to youtube.com slash at Blaze TV to watch the live event. You subscribers can watch for free. Uh, thank you, don't go anywhere. Uh, I got one more thing I wanna get off my chest. Are we being played, are we being manipulated as it relates to this feud between Caitlin Clark and all these WNBA players? Are they triggering us? Are they manipulating us? Are they actually doing exactly what they wanna do and baiting us into watching the WNBA? TJ and I will talk about it next. different for black women. Oh my God, what happens to black women? It's unbelievable. Why are you the way that you are? Honestly. You're the most coddled, delusional group of people in America. Oh no, he didn't. And I say that and you'll think, oh, we're like this, he's black. No, I don't. Throw me a frickin' bone here. I want you to course correct your mentality, that victimhood mentality that you're constantly, constantly preaching. What I'm trying to say is she didn't make herself the villain. She showed up unapologetically herself in the same way that men do all the time. Because everybody, every it's making us look like clowns. Welcome back. Uh, as I just told you, I think we're getting played. This whole Caitlin Clark and everybody in the WNBA and all these old battle axes, they all hate Caitlin Clark. Or, or maybe they don't. Maybe it's all just a gimmick to get us to watch the WNBA. Uh, let's watch. I, I believe we got a clip here of Diana Taurasi, Diana Taurasi talking about Caitlin Clark coming into the WNBA. I think this is a marketing ploy. Let's watch. There's some stars going to the WNBA. I know on the NBA side, like those guys, those vets are just like, all right, come get it, young fella, right? When the college guys come out, they're waiting for them. I mean, Camilla's coming, Caitlin's coming. There's more than just that that are coming. What will the league have in store for them when they get there? Look, SVP, um, <laughs> reality is coming. Okay. <laughs> you know, there's, there's yes. levels to this thing. And that's just life. We all went through it. Of course. Um, and you see it on the NBA side. It, and you're going to see it on this side where, you know, they, you look superhuman playing against 18-year-olds, but you're going to come with some grown women that have been playing professional basketball for a long time. Not saying that it's not going to translate because when you're great at what you do, you're just going to get better. But there is going to be a transition period where you're going to have to give yourself some grace as a rookie. And, uh, you know, it might take a little bit longer for some people. TJ, yesterday I'm scrolling through Twitter and I see this billboard, this poster, the GOAT versus the rookie. And it's a big image of Diana Taurasi and her face. And Diana Taurasi needs to sue whoever put this picture out because whew, it's not good. 
But <laughs> as good as she looks, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Anyway, but it's the goat versus the rookie, and it's a little silhouette image of of Caitlin Clark, and I think it's June thirtieth. Diana Taurasi versus Caitlin Clark, and and immediately I was like, oh man, I can't wait to watch that. And then I remembered, <laughs> it's the WNBA. <laughs> I'm not watching that, but I, I that's when it just dawned on me like. They're playing a game with us. This is WWE. This is WWF, WWE. What is it? WWE or WWF? WWE. WWF was your day. And oh, they changed it. WWE. From Federation to Entertainment. Okay. So that's all this is. This is a gimmick to trigger guys like me and to, that like Caitlin Clark. Now they want me to hate Diana Taurasi, Brianna Stewart, and all these old heads. And they, it's working because. There's a chance I'm going to watch this game on June 30th. We're being played here. I actually didn't think anything Diana said there was out of bounds. <clears throat> she just, it, that's, yeah. that would have been very normal for any, if, if, if these were some dudes, you say, all right, Rook, particularly in football, you say, all right, Rook, it, it's going to take you a little time here. And because that's just the arrogance of the vets. And they say, we all had a learning curve and you're going to come in and you're going to be fine. Show me anywhere where veterans have been talking about rookies, though, in, in, in the NBA or the NFL. Happens privately in every conversation. Privately. Yeah. All they, this stuff that's been going on has been publicly. But you've never seen Diana Taurasi say anything. We have no idea how she operates. because we've never cared. That's my point, right? We don't know. I actually don't know. She's got a, she, she is probably obligated to operate differently to try to bring attention as opposed to these other. But everybody's saying this everywhere. This, it's exactly the conversations you have. The coaches tell you that when you come in. Okay, but I'm starting to think, take Lynette Woodard, mm -hmm. going to Iowa, taking the invitation to be courtside when she breaks the record, and then being caught on camera somewhere accidentally taking a pot shot at Caitlin Clark. The no, that was, she was at a podium, she was at an award show. That wasn't accidental. Her saying, again, she she's, it looks, or I think she did it intentionally, knowing someone was going to take cell phone footage and get it put out. Yeah. That's why I'm putting the accidental in right. quote. <clears throat> and I'm saying all of this is Cheryl Swopes. I'm starting to think this is a psyop. All, all the over-the-top <laughs> hatred towards Caitlin Clark is actually a brilliant marketing strategy for the WNBA. That's what I'm arguing. And so. I tell you this privately all the time. You are smarter than the average person, I think by quite a bit, and so you think through things at a level that these people, what happened probably is that these women who are jealous and hate Caitlin Clark accidentally tripped into something that would help promote these future matchups. Listen, I, and I wish, you know what, we should have had Jill Savage or someone on the show to get the woman. Women are catty. Mm -hmm but they love to pretend that they're not. And so them talking trash about Caitlin Clark behind the scenes and hating her guts behind the scenes makes perfect sense. All of this public animus, all the tweet, Angel Reese subtweeting and uh, all during the game, the, you know, basically insinuating the game's rigged for Caitlin Clark. Every, they saw how, look, Angel Reese doing this. Mm -hmm. It led to monster ratings. It led to Angel Reese being a bigger star. I'm saying this stuff is calculated and it's working. I, there was never a chance of me watching a WNBA game. <laughs> now there's a 10%, maybe 20% chance I'm going to watch because they've triggered an emotion in me. It's like, I don't like them. And they like, they just need me to feel something about Diana Taurasi because I used to feel nothing. Yep. And so, oh, Animus, that works. And he likes Caitlin Clark? That works even better. Well, and this is the argument that I was too stupid to acknowledge that I made yesterday and that Angel Reese is a villain, that was a good thing. These women are making themselves villain and villains and that's a good thing. The one thing I would tell you is, are we sure that a group of women who actually would rather be men act like women most of the time. So Diana Taurasi and these- Factory like, settings, TJ. Everybody has factory settings. They do, but these, these women, what most women don't walk around all day upset and annoyed that they're not treated like men. These women do. 
So then you operate in a way that gets you that sort of treatment. One that again. Diana Taurasi, Brianna Stewart, uh, this group of lesbians in the WNBA. They're all mad they're not men. All of them. And they're all mad they don't get... Are you sure they're mad they're not men or they, 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 there's some benefit that, men, that they believe men get that they want? It's the same thing to me. Mm. So I would tell you, they wish they were men. Their athletes, all, all, most female athletes, I would tell you, wish they were men. Because they like their sport, they don't get the respect, mm. and that they would rather be men, particularly the lesbian athletes. They, they're sleeping with women like all the men. I mean, I think they would rather be men. They're upset that they're not men, and then they operate accordingly. So they, why can't I be competitive? If a man did this, you'd be saying this. If a man, and all day, every day, they, if a man was playing as well as I'm playing, they'd have 20 million viewers. If, if a man was playing as well as I am, they'd have, I'd be making $30 million over and over and over all day, every day. This is what these women do. And so should we be surprised when they operate like a group of dudes? I'm not sure if they're operating like a group of dudes, but you've given me much to think about. Someone hop in the comments, or some of y'all hop in the comments and help me think through what TJ's are because I can't dismiss it in terms of, of are, are these guys authentically upset? Are, does every, no, this is the one I really want y'all to think. Every, or a lot of, I don't want to mischaracterize, a lot of women who play sports secretly wish they were men. Mm -hmm. Y'all believe that? And some of you female athletes, do y'all believe that? Uh, hit me over email, fearlessblazeshow at gmail.com, or hop in the comments in the chat. I got to think that one through. We may have to follow back up on that one and, and get a female voice in that discussion. It's a former athlete. I don't, I don't You don't buy it, huh? Well, I just don't, you know, I, I, I go back to my factory setting. And, and I go back to, like, in my day, like, I'm thinking about the college athletes at Ball State. And some of them, I could call a name. We had a six foot three girl, six foot two, uh, that was Russian, I believe. And she wanted to be a girl. And, mm. and, you know, a lot of brothers on the football team helped her out. Uh, <laughs> I, so this is not a blanket statement, but it is a statement I think I'd make about Diana Taurasi and many of these other. You, when you present yourself as though you're a dude, then why should I not believe that you want to be a dude? Well, that's Diana Taurasi. Yeah, but I think the WNBA is full of Diana Taurasi's. Brittany Griner doesn't want to be a dude? Yeah, that, that, yes, I, I think there are some yeah. that want to be, and there are some that feel, I got no choice. This is the culture... They I'm present themselves tall. as women. I'm too tall. Again, I, I couldn't imagine being a woman. Ta ta I, again, I go back to my factory settings. I will call this name because she's a very uh, great, now she's no longer a young person. She's the same age as me. Linda Godby. We had a great basketball player at my high school, Linda Godby. She went to Auburn. She's a five-star recruit, helped Auburn to some Final Fours. She's six foot six. Attractive. Beautiful. Uh, and she, even at our, 55, 56 now, still uh, very feminine, very, but she's a good basketball player. And, and she, I don't think, and again, I, I don't know Linda well. I remember her from high school, and I've talked with her briefly at some point post-career or whatever. But Linda was always a woman and still is to this day. So I think we're agreeing here. What I'm saying is, is there's, there's a ton of Diana Taurasi. So we agree on Diana Taurasi and Brittany Griner. And I would say the WNBA is 25%, 40% of those women. And that's the women I'm talking about. And those are the stars. How many, how many super... Skylar Diggins, she would be a star. Yeah. And look, I think Angel Reese presents herself as a woman. Yes. So... Fake eyelashes, that's fake the, weave. That's not who I'd be all. talking about. Yeah. But these other women that are... Angel Reese has a reason to dislike Caitlin Clark, right? They, they were actually competitors that she got beat by her recently. And it's a, you, these other women are just jealous of her. All right, we got a lot to think about. We may have to circle back to this topic. Uh, we'll play some tomorrow. Uh, we'll see you tomorrow.
freedom Came like a fighter, striking like a ladder Making all this moves for freedom I want freedom No negotiation, my system, no relation We all just wanna have freedom Sitting on the corner, never been alone I'm breaking my back for freedom Bless, we are living, get back We are receiving, all deceiving We all wanna be free We want freedom I just want, I wanna be, I just want